So types of aqueous solutions. Um, let's think about two familiar aqueous solutions, salt water and sugar water. Um, both of these are homogeneous mixtures and they appear to be very similar. You take this white solid, you put it in water, you stir it, it disappears, um, and it looks like water. How do those solids disappear into the water? They, sugar and salt do this in um, somewhat different ways. So here we have, um, we're looking at, well, what are we looking at? We're looking at purple balls and kind of green balls is what we're doing here. Um, here we have the purple is representing the solute, would be the sugar or the salt that we're trying to dissolve in the water. And these green balls are representing the solvent molecules. So in order for the salt or the sugar to dissolve in the water, we have to disrupt these interactions that are holding the solute particles together. And we're going to form interactions between the solvent particles and the solute particles. There are also interactions between the solvent molecules and those will also have to be somewhat disrupted. So if you think about putting, um, say, sugar into water, right? Why is water a liquid? Because the individual molecules are attracted to each other and stay together in the liquid form. Why is sugar a solid at room temperature? Because the sugar molecules are attracted to each other and stick together. When we put these two things together, the sugar molecules have to come away from each other and the water molecules have to separate away from each other and they have to all mix together thoroughly. I think of this a little bit, we'll, we'll study what those interactions are in much more detail later. So it's kind of awkward to talk about this right now. I think of it a little bit as being people from different countries speaking different languages. So I'm gonna use my ethnic background and my husband's ethnic background, and that way no one can accuse me of picking on someone, right? Because I'm picking on myself and my husband. So my husband's ancestors came from Japan. In Japan, they speak Japanese. My ancestors came from Sweden. People speak Swedish. Uh, of course, now everybody speaks, most everyone speaks English too, but we're gonna pretend that doesn't happen. So let's say that maybe these are my ancestors, a bunch of Swedes, and they're speaking to each other in Swedish and they're getting along, right? They're interacting. And then here are my husband's ancestors, the Japanese, and they're talking to each other. And so you could imagine a large room with maybe 50 Japanese people or 50 Swedish people. Are they going to mingle and mix around? No. You'll have clumps of Swedes talking to each other and clumps of Japanese people talking to each other, but they're not going to really interact because they can't communicate, right? So when we put two chemicals together, they don't always mix. What happens if you put sand into water? It just sinks to the bottom, right? Because the sand particles are more interested in each other than they are in the water. They can't communicate. So that's like a group of people who don't speak the same language as those around them. So in order for a solution to happen, we have to have a method of communication. So now if we wave a magic wand or the magic apple pencil and um, say, ta-da, everyone can speak English in addition to their native tongue. Now will those people mix? Probably will, right? got a whole bunch of people and they can all communicate with each other they're probably going to mix up fairly fairly thoroughly okay so that's what's happening when we make a solution <coughs> so it comes down to relative strengths of the interactions between the different kinds of particles so we have to talk a little bit about what's going on here so here's our water molecule, and it looks a little different. Usually we have this being red and these being white. Here we're trying to show the charge distribution. 
within the water molecule. The hydrogen and the oxygen are bonded together with a covalent bond, which is sharing of electrons. You can share with someone and it's not always even sharing, right? If you've ever slept in a double bed with someone, you know that there's always issues with the blankets, right? There's always one person who's trying to take the blankets all night. You, you may not realize it, but they're blanket hogs, right? So this, in these chemical bonds, we often have electron hogs. And oxygen hogs the electrons. They are shared with hydrogen, but hydrogen's getting the short end of the deal. So the hydrogen end of this bond is going to be a little bit positive and the oxygen end is going to be a little bit negative. And we use this, this is the Greek lowercase delta, kind of looks like a D with a posture issue. Um, delta minus and delta plus, that's to represent a partial charge. These aren't ions. This might be a, a 0.1 charge and a 0.1 charge. It's just a fraction of a charge. So we have water molecules, they are not ions, but they have a, a positive-ish side and a negative-ish side, right? So if we're gonna put our sodium chloride in here, the sodium and the chloride ions are attracted to each other because they are ions of opposite charges, right? We've got this electrochemical, no, not electrochemical, electrical charge, and they're attracted to each other. In order to get the sodium chloride to dissolve, we have to pull them away. There has to be something else that's going to attract them and replace that attraction that they have for each other. So the sodium, the positive ion, is going to be attracted to the negative end of a water molecule. The negative ion is attracted to the positive end of a water molecule. And so we've got some good solvent solute interactions, a way that these can communicate with each other and so we can have a solution forming. So this positive one sodium ion is not going to be satisfied with just hanging out with one water molecule because that, that partial charge on the oxygen is just a partial charge it's going to take several water molecules surrounding this ion to make it feel comfortable. And then it's like, oh, well, yeah, I'm good with you guys. I've got all of you partial negative guys around me. We can go off and just swim around. And the pot negatively charged chloride ion is going to have the water molecules with their positive ends turned towards it. And that's gonna replace that comforting charge that it had that was attracting it to the sodium ion. Does that make sense? I think of this as, you know, these guys are, are really good buddies and, you know, they're just like hanging tight with each other, right? And here come the water molecules and they're trying to lure them away, right? So they're going to kind of come around, oh, come on, you, you know, you're, you're great, we like you, and, you know, uh, and they, they kind of lure them away, right? And then that will continue to happen until it's all thoroughly mixed. So what we end up with is charged ions that are free to move throughout the water. We've got positive ones and negative ones, ions that are free to move. Electricity is the flow of electrons, the flow of electrical charge. Because we have charged particles that can move, this solution can conduct electricity. Not all solutions will do that. So we, we call that sort of solution an electrolyte. And that is used in the same way that they refer to electrolytes in Gatorade and Powerade and other sports drinks. So oh, you need to replenish your electrolytes. Well, yeah, you do. If you're perspiring a lot, you're gonna lose a lot of salt, not just sodium chloride, but potassium and other things. And you need to replenish that. So when we take um, something like table salt, sodium chloride, and we put that into solution, it separates into ions and can conduct electricity. That's called an electrolyte. Electrolyte um, is a substance that will dissolve in water to form a solution that conducts electricity. All soluble ionic compounds are electrolytes. Here we have a, an, uh, 
a conductivity apparatus where we have a battery attached to a light bulb and then these two wires instead of touching each other are in this beaker of water and if they're in a beaker of distilled water or deionized water the light bulb will not do anything if we pour some table salt in there and stir it up those ions allow the electrical charge to move from the one wire to the other and the light bulb will glow. If we put sugar, which looks a lot like salt, right? If we put sugar in the water, stir it up, it dissolves, but the light bulb won't glow. Because when sugar dissolves, it has molecules instead of ions and the molecules don't have charges and so it cannot conduct electricity. Non-electrolytes do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Sugar is a non-electrolyte. Most molecular compounds are non-electrolytes. So how does sugar dissolve in water? Well, here's a sugar molecule, sucrose. It's kind of complicated. Um, it's got a bunch of carbons on the inside, and then it's got hydrogens and oxygens on the outside. Well, these hydrogens and oxygens are having that same blanket electron war as the ones in the water molecules. And the oxygen is, is winning here as well. And so these hydrogens are slightly positive. They'll be attracted to the slightly negative charge on the oxygen end of the water molecule. The hydrogen here attracted to that one. This slightly negative oxygen on the sugar is attracted to the slightly positive hydrogen on the water. And so these guys are gonna come around much like they did for the sodium chloride and carry them off and allow the sugar molecules to move around. But there are no charged things. There aren't any ions here that can move. Yeah, the water molecule has kind of a partial charge on one side and a partial charge on the other side, but overall it's neutral. So the sugar solution will not conduct electricity. We learned how to name acids and recognize their formulas. Acids are molecular compounds, but when you put them into water, they form ions. So acids are molecular compounds that form ions when dissolved in water. Those ions will be a hydrogen cation and whatever's left of that molecule. So here we have Hc2H3O2. This hydrogen can come off as an H plus, and what we've got left then is C2H3O2 minus, which is the acetate ion. The molecules of the acid are pulled apart by their attraction for the water molecules. We have strong acids and we have weak acids. A strong acid will ionize completely. This is something like HCl, Hydrochloric acid, you dissolve that in water, it separates completely into ions. They all fall apart. There are also weak acids, and weak acids do not ionize completely. So here we have a weak acid. This is acetic acid. And if you were able to look and see what are the particles actually doing, we'd see that we have a lot of intact acetic acid molecules. We have some acetate ions and some hydrogen ions. It ionizes a little bit. So this is a weak acid. Does it conduct electricity? Are there charged particles that can move? There are, but there aren't a whole lot of them. This is an electrolyte, but it's a weak electrolyte. HCl is a strong acid. It makes a strong electrolyte because it makes more ions. When we look at weak acids and we write the equation for them um, ionizing, we typically use a double-headed arrow to indicate that both sides are present. We have HF present and we have hydrogen and fluoride ions present. This arrow just goes in one direction and so we're implying that all of the HCl becomes H plus and Cl minus ions.
So we use the words strong and weak in the same way for acids and for electrolytes. Strong electrolytes dissolve completely as ions. They conduct electricity well. The light bulb, the light from that bulb is strong. Weak electrolytes dissolve mostly as, ion, as molecules, but a little bit as ions. Those are the weak acids. They conduct electricity weakly, so the light bulb is weak. <coughs> Here we have pictures. So a non-electrolyte, there's no light, because there's no ions. Here's a weak electrolyte. That light bulb is on, but it's very weak. Right? We have some ions in solution. And here we have a strong electrolyte. A strong acid would also do this. It glows brightly because there's lots of ions and the, the current can flow. Any questions? So when acids dissolve, they are molecular compounds and they form ions that weren't there before, so that's called ionization. When we take an ionic compound that in its pure form already contains ions and we put that in water, we don't say it ionizes because that would be forming ions. We call it dissociation because the ions that were already there are now disassociating from each other. So we can look at something like sodium sulfide. We should recognize this as an ionic compound because sodium is a metal and sulfur is a nonmetal. And so when we have this aqueous, we understand that that's actually sodium ions and sulfide ions. This formula tells us that there are two sodium ions and one sulfide ion. And so when we show how it dissociates, we write two sodium ions and one sulfide ion. And the charges on these ions, we learned about in chapter three and a little in two, we get those from the periodic table or from memorizing the polyatomic ions. In the second example, we have <coughs> sodium sulfate, which has a polyatomic ion. The polyatomic ion stays together. We've got sodium ions and sulfate ions. So we learn to name these by identifying the two ions in the, for in the formula. And when we put these into solution, we get those same two ions. In this example, well, actually in both of these examples, there were two of the sodium ions but they're sodium ions, Na+, plus, they are not Na2, 2+. Plus. They're just single sodium ions. So when an ionic compound dissolves, we have separated ions that will conduct electricity. But not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. Some do and some don't. So to simplify things, we, we say that a compound that dissolves in water is soluble, and a compound that does not is insoluble. Now, if you go on to Chem 1B, you'll learn that even something that's insoluble does dissolve a little bit. But for practical purposes, it, it's not important. And so we're going to keep things simpler and say, well, it dissolves or it doesn't dissolve, soluble or insoluble. <coughs> So here we've got um, silver nitrate. If you put solid silver nitrate in solution, it dissolves very nicely, forms a strong electrolyte solution. If you take silver chloride and try to dissolve that in water, it's just gonna sit there. You can stir it, you can heat it, you can do anything you want. It's just gonna sit there. Here's an actual picture of it. It's got a slightly purple color. Kind of like sand or dirt. You can stir it up and then wish as hard as you want, but you can't get it to dissolve. It just won't. So why does silver nitrate dissolve and silver chloride not dissolve? Well, it's kind of complicated. It's not really easy to predict. There are some patterns in it, but there's, it's not like predicting charges of of non-metal ions or anything like that. So um, the best way to figure this out is you, we do experiments. Okay, well here's this compound. Put some in water and stir it up. Did it dissolve? Yeah, okay, that one's soluble. Here, let's try this one. Did that one dissolve? Yep. Did this one dissolve? No. And 
You go through and you test a whole bunch of things. This has already been done, so we don't have to do this. But it's an empirical method, just a, a try it and see. And then we look for patterns. So this is um, a somewhat simplified list of solubility rules. Um, we have these green and yellow cardstock handouts that students really love. And one of those, I think it's the green one, has a chart like this on it. It's slightly different. Um, this is the one we're going to use. And so if there's a conflict between that, the other chart and this chart, go with this chart. So this looks a little like a lot of stuff there, right? You need to memorize this chart. I know. I'm going to show you that it's actually not that bad. Because there's a lot of stuff in here that doesn't really need to be in here. So let's, let's look at this. There's two parts to this chart. On the top part, these are things that are generally soluble and a list of exceptions, because there have to be exceptions, right? And on the bottom, these are things that are generally insoluble and they're exceptions. And it's the exceptions that are confusing. So what we have up here, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. Lithium, sodium, and potassium, those are group one metals. All of their compounds are soluble. They don't make an insoluble compound with anything. And so you just kind of learn those. And the way we're going to learn them is we're going to do it over and over and over again until we just start to remember it. Next, we have nitrate and acetate. And those are also always soluble. So lead acetate, it's soluble. Potassium nitrate, it's soluble. That's why silver nitrate is soluble. Nitrate is soluble with everything. Then we have chloride, bromide, and iodide. Those are the halides. And those are soluble most of the time. There's only three notable exceptions. So we don't need all these words. So we've got silver, mercury, or lead. You might say, well, Mercury 2, 2 plus, what's that? Well, it's technically called Mercury 1. <coughs> there is an ion that's Mercury 2. Um, I'm not going to trick you with that. Um, so you can just remember Mercury. So if you've got Mercury with one of these ions, it will be insoluble. But other, other than these three, these compounds containing these are always soluble. And we've got sulfate. And again, we've got all of this business here. So we don't need all these... Oops, I do need that part. I need all those words. So, um, strontium, barium, um, and, and calcium, those are group two metals. And then there's lead and silver. And here's lead and silver were exceptions up there. And so we're going to see some common ions as exceptions. So in the bottom here, hydroxide compounds and sulfide compounds are generally insoluble. Exceptions, when they pair with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. Well, do we need to remember this? Not if we learn to go through this in order. If we start at the top, if we have sodium hydroxide and we're trying to decide if it's going to be soluble or not, we see sodium, it doesn't matter what it's with, it's soluble. We're not going to get down here then if we see one of these. So we don't need this exception at all. Let's just get rid of that one. Because we're going to take care of that by starting at the top of the list. So here, when sulfide pairs with calcium, strontium, or barium, ooh, there's calcium, strontium, and barium again, this one is actually soluble. And with the hydroxide and those, it's slightly soluble. So we don't need to get hung up on the difference between slightly soluble and soluble. And so we'll just remember those as exceptions.
with it looking a little simpler. When we get down here, carbonate and phosphate, when these pair with those guys, they're soluble. Oh, well, that's that top line again. We don't need that as an exception. Any questions? The way you remember this is by using it. So we're going to have lots of situations where you need to predict if something's a solid or it's aqueous. Does it dissolve or not? Try to go through this in your head first and decide and then look at the chart and confirm or correct yourself. So how do we do this? Predict whether each compound is soluble or insoluble. So we've got nickel sulfide. So what we're going to do is we're going to mentally go through that, that list. And at the top we had lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. Now we don't have one of those. We had nitrate and, and um, acetate. We don't have one of those. We had chloride, bromide, and iodide. Don't have one of those. We had sulfate. Don't have one of those. Get down into the, now these are mostly insoluble ones towards the bottom. And the first one is hydroxide or sulfide. Here's sulfide. Sulfide compounds are insoluble except with calcium barium and strontium. This isn't calcium barium or strontium. So this is insoluble. So we're going to say this is insoluble. It's not going to dissolve. Here's magnesium phosphate. We'll go through that list in our heads. Lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium? No. Nitrate or acetate? No. Chloride, bromide, iodide? No. Sulfate? No. Okay, so now we're down into the bottom where they're mostly insoluble. Hydroxide or sulfide? No. Phosphate. Are there any exceptions for phosphate? I, well, yeah, but once we've gone through the table, are there any exceptions? No. So what's this one? Insoluble. How about this one? Lithium carbonate. We start at the top. What's the first list? It's got lithium. Lithium compounds are always soluble, no exceptions. So this is soluble. We don't need to go down in the chart and find carbonate and find that this is an exception for carbonate because the first line tells us it's soluble. Ammonium chloride. Soluble. That's also in the first line. Any questions?